Good evening. <coughs> Call this uh, board work session to order. And the uh, purpose of tonight's meeting is to build trust and teamwork, to exchange information, and when applicable, to provide direction in order to facilitate efficient and effective decision making at regular board meetings. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bout for check in. Sorry, Randy, I forgot we we're sharing mics again. Um, just quickly, let's go around the table and introduce ourselves. Um, and we do have a little different procedure tonight because of the ECMAC report, so we are uh, videotaping that. And then the uh, second half of the meeting, which will focus on priority results, will be audio uh, taped as a regular work session. Uh, but let's start with introductions, and we'll go to my right. Jackie Mosqueda Jones, board member. Kelsey Dawson Walton, <coughs> board member. Jessica Craig, school board member. Mike Ostafi, board member. Heather Douglas, school board member. Tanya Simons, school board member. Stephen Flisk, assistant superintendent. Patrick Smith, interim assistant superintendent. Yeah, I'm good. Kelly Parpart, <laughs> assistant superintendent. <laughs> <laughs> Barb Olson, director of school community relations. Patricia Magnuson, ECMAC facilitator. Okay. Ron Meyer, executive director of finance and operations. And again, our topics for this evening, the first half will be on uh, focus on Enrollment Capacity Management Advisory Committee, which is why Patricia has joined us for the evening. And, um, and they'll actually have two pieces of reporting tonight. And then we'll dive into the rep uh, priority results. I did want to inform the board that when we finish the last priority result on the middle level programming, and we'll take a, uh, some time to talk about next year, what the priority results should be, uh, you'll have administrative recommendations in front of you, but then it's time for your input back to me to help uh, fashion the, the final document. And then I'll bring a, a, a draft of that to the June 4th work session for you to, to review. And then hopefully we can finalize it that night and then have you uh, adopt it at the June 18th uh, school board meeting. So that's kind of the process going forward with the priority results. And I just wanted our... Uh, viewing audience to know what those steps would be. So with that in mind, I'll turn it over now to Ron and Patricia. Thank you. So um, as the agenda suggests, we're here to uh, give some background and information in particular because we have three new board members. And so to really give you an understanding of how ECMAC came to be, what the purpose of ECMAC is, some of the um, work that we're currently doing and then looking into the future in terms of some of the next steps. So our outcomes for uh, today's presentation is that board members will understand the components, development, and history of the Enrollment and Capacity Management Framework and then the Enrollment and Capacity Management Advisory Committee or affectionately known as ECMAC. And so as uh, Dr. Balk um, said, uh, Patricia Magnuson is here. Um, you know her from the former Executive Director of Finance and Operations. She's graciously stayed on to ensure a really smooth transition uh, with the work of ECMAC. She's been heavily invested in that work for the last four years, and she's going to uh, she's the resident expert or the expert to be able to walk us through um, how we came to where we're at with ECMAC. And so with that, I will, um, I will turn it over to Patricia. Thank you, Ron. Um, good evening, Chair Ostafi, Superintendent Bauk, and members of the board and cabinet. Um, I'm happy to be here to talk about um, the ECMAC work. Before I start, I just want to remind the board, I've said it many times, that this um, commitment from our community to engage in this type of work is not something that is common. I don't know. You're creating a framework here and a practice that is unprecedented and I think can, will really serve the district well over time. And so it's something that you should be really proud of that um, so many community members are committed to this work. So um, I think that's something you should feel proud of. The ECMAC, um, the idea of looking at closely enrollment and capacity management came out of the strategic plan. And it was one of the strategies, um, it came out of one of the strategies that we will uh, leverage and align the talents of our employees and the assets of our system to achieve our mission and strategic objectives. It was a part of that, it wasn't really a priority result in the first year when we first got a task force together. And this is um, back in the beginning, about four and a half years ago or more now, 
Um, we had a task force of 18 community members. There were um, 12 staff members, including some teachers. We had outside facilitation, which was key, because then all of us who were sort of content area experts on staff could be full participants in the task force, and all of their meetings were open to observers, and we did have observers throughout that time. Some of the things that were interesting is we had 93 applications that first year, and we've had that many applicants every year since then. There is a really strong interest across the entire district, and we worked really hard to be sure that all of the communities of Osseo area schools were represented, that as many schools as possible would be represented, um, and that um, it was racially as closely aligned as possible to the students of Osseo area schools. We spent a lot of time together really talking through in that first year, here's how we do enrollment, here's how um, we look at school capacity, here's how we make decisions about um, additions to schools and, and walked through process after process and had teams of staff members come in and that group was committed and learned a lot about um, the processes of Osseo area schools and we started to try to create a framework or a pattern about how we would look at those things so that year over year our staff and our community could come to rely on the same kinds of calculations, the same kinds of ways of looking at data so that there shouldn't be surprises over time. And so this is one example of what an early framework was beginning to look like. Um, we used manipulatives, we had drawings on paper, we had community members who came and did subcommittee work. So would meet in between the meetings and help us think things through. Um, and then we finally evolved into this beautiful framework that actually um, has every word on here was poured over by that um, committee. And I want to just walk you through, in fact, this next set of slides was created by one of the original task force members. She um, wanted to help us, in fact, I think she did that part of the presentation the first year, help us to make sure that we walked through with the school board and the community all of the parts of this framework so it could have life beyond that original task force. So you can see there's a purpose on top, there's a framework, and then there's some guiding principles, and even the arrows, and the color coding of the dark blue and the light blue. They all mean something. And we'll just walk through each of those. So the purpose was really important. Um, so the purpose of the framework is to increase community trust in Osseo area schools through engagement in long-range planning for enrollment and building use. And for those of us who have been engaged in work with school districts for a long time, <clears throat> conversations about building use and things associated with building capacity are not great trust builders for school districts. And it seems like those two things are counterintuitive, but we believed in something bigger here, that we could actually do that by engaging in work in a really open and transparent way. So we were committed to that idea of building trust through this work. It took a while for us to land on, we talked about having the mission at the center or the strategic plan, and ultimately we went, oh yeah, students belong at the center of this framework. We aren't making decisions about adults, or um, we're making decisions that are in the best interest of students. And so that was clear, and that's very important. Um, and that's why even the word students is bigger than almost anything in the framework. And then we had, as I said, paraded through department after department to walk through all of the details of how we make calculations and enroll families and all of the forms. And at the end of that, the task force basically said, okay, we got that. You know, you guys have that down. You have processes down. We're really good in Osseo area schools about um, processes. And um, so things like creating enrollment projections and looking at capacity of buildings and doing our staffing and running the lotteries that are run in the enrollment center and processing all of the students that come and go throughout the year and in the summer, that just goes on. Um, and the, the task force vetted those, those um, processes and I think those processes can change through our normal continuous improvement and they do. But that's sort of outside of the work of ECMAC. It's the ongoing process and the way I have come to think about this framework is that's the stuff that we, that every school district does. You could take this work and set it into any school district and the processes are kind of the same because we follow the same state laws and the same MDE guidelines. And we do this really well as school districts and then we lift our head up and go, oh, it looks like there's a capacity problem. 
we might need to make a boundary change, we might need to close a building, we might need to open a building, and then suddenly we have to inform an entire community about something that we might have been behind our closed doors thinking about for a long time. But it is so problematic to bring those conversations into the public eye because they cause a lot of angst, and they should. We're talking about people's students, and their children, and that's, and, and that's um, a really important topic for them. And so the idea then was to find a different way to pull ourselves out of that, that center and really do our work really in public. Everything we do is a matter of public information, but to really complete our work in public. So what, we, what the idea is that we would do our work and then in systematic ways that arrow pops out at the top of this framework and all of the dark blue are places where the Enrollment and Capacity Management Advisory Committee would start engaging with us. So we, over the first year, and you'll learn more about this, we learned about a common set of data we would begin to analyze and then begin to make recommendations. So there'd be an, an analysis of the data and then recommendations at the end of the year sort of dispassionate way of looking at the data. It looks like this is the problem. I would recommend you go do something about that problem. And then the, the left-hand side of the framework is when we engage with community relations, how should we be talking about this and publicizing the work that we're doing to the broader community, um, which we have done all the way, everything ECMEC has ever done is on the district website and has been for, for many years. So everything is out there, but how do we begin to engage in the process of change, if change is what's recommended. So that's what happens on the left-hand side. This part over to the right um, is perhaps one of the places where we spent most of our time um, to be really clear about the principles that would guide our work. And I'm just gonna read through those because they were really important. Um, that we would be concise and informed by data. And sometimes being data informed can come into conflict with other things, and you'll see a little bit more about that as, as we get deeper into the work that we've done. That we will align with district racial equity work, so we will always view things through the lens of race. Um, that things that we recommend will be sustainable. We won't make knee-jerk reactions and make changes that have to be reversed in a couple of years. We're always trying to look at the long term. We identify and examine the implications for all students. Um, we didn't want to try to list all the types of students, but that every single student um, should be thought about as we're, as we're making change. That we should identify potential costs and consider funding strategies. For instance, we sh shouldn't be recommending things that don't even make sense. Um, we should build five new schools and have them online by next fall. You know, something ridiculous that we would think through what's, what's really possible for a school district to accomplish. And perhaps one of the most important things that that task force spent time on was this last one, B, that our recommendations would be made with as much advance notice as possible when change is recommended. One of the themes that we heard throughout that year of that, year and a half really, of that task force work was change, I can accept change, but I need time to react as a family, to make decisions with the caregivers in my family, and to work through change with my child. And so that was really important, and that was one of the gifts, I think, of the ECMAC framework, is it gives us time. That is, as community members hear this data, over time, they can start to think about the implications for their own family. So then we had a framework, and um, the strategic plan in that first year for fiscal 2017 actually talked about ECMAC then as one of the priority results. And the, the priority result was that ECMAC um, has been created to increase community trust in the work around enrollment and capacity. So that was a part, that was one of the um, strategic priorities. And then we had the, the backing of the school board and the superintendent um, for the work that we did. And again, we brought together, the original task force disbanded and we had two members that stayed with us that are still with us. And I think they're finally gonna have, they're gonna give up the, yeah. the the fight, but um, they've stayed with us for four years and the original commitment was just for the task force. So we were happy to have them and then a whole new set of community members began with us. And so we started to create patterns around the work that we do. We started going out to schools and meeting in schools, which was really great. I don't think we met in the schools on the task force. Mm -hmm. And it was an idea that emerged from them and that was, I think, one of the favorite parts of every meeting is getting to meet the principal have a conversation with a principal in, in a district of this size, 
um, folks were able to get into a school that they didn't even know existed sometimes. So that was a really valuable part of the work that we would meet in schools. It makes it hard logistically, but I think it's really important. And then we began to just learn about data and district work and bringing in um, enrollment and capacity calculations and ironing them out, wrinkling them up and ironing them out again, really digging into them that first year so we could figure out what is it that we believe about these things. And then we had our first summary of progress report. It was a rough copy that first year, but it created sort of a frame for how we would report out our work. And you can see on the wall there, we continued that tradition this year. Um, there might be a less paper intensive way, but we just put that thing up on the wall and edited by hand. So every community member and staff member that was a part of it could really um, have their hand. Um, we actually had a community <coughs> member that drafted the executive summary um, in that first year. But these were our recommendations for action. And really we were studying potential things in that first year. There was nothing that was really concrete or clear. We could see some looming issues on the horizon. But again, that was the beauty of the framework, that we were looking way ahead. And we weren't just sitting in our offices looking at it. We were talking about it in the community as a whole. So then we came back the second year after we had done some work over the summer. Again, it stayed as a priority result um, in the second year. Um, and we did just the same thing again. We were learning about data and district work. And in the second year, we got a lot more sophisticated about calculations that we would embrace. Um, and part of that is because we brought on um, a professional partner in Wold Architects and Engineers. They had experience across many school districts around the state and were able to bring a framework that, um, to help us think about a, a, um, a permanent way of thinking about things, brought just a different perspective for us. And one of the tools they brought us was this way of thinking about how to get to a recommendation. We knew ECMAC, ECMAC's job was to get to a recommendation, but a thing that we learned through our work with Wold is that we were really good at gathering data, we were really good at interpreting data, but then we were leaping to developing options and recommendations, and we had to pause on that, let's build a shared understanding of this need. We might be really data-driven and clear as a whole and to a person on ECMAC, but until somebody agrees that my school is too full <coughs> and therefore we should make a boundary change or therefore we should use taxpayer money to build a new building, if somebody doesn't agree with the data or believe the data, we haven't developed a shared understanding of need and we should not move on until we've got to that place. Now I don't know the magic answer of when you've got a, you know, a consensus around that, but I think it's something that I, you know, as a board you learn over time. So what we did was made sure that we were building a shared understanding of need and it took a lot of work to keep <coughs> pulling ourselves back from developing options and thinking through solutions and let's just stay on the side of the stop sign and let's really make sure we agree with what we have, um, the data we have before us. And so I wanna talk you through how we framed the two really important data points. What's the enrollment? of each school and what is the capacity of each school. And one of the first things that the task force learned that I think was a big light bulb, the task force, I mean, in the first um, year that was creating the framework is that capacity isn't a set number. Like the fire marshal doesn't set capacity or I don't walk in and go, that's the capacity of that building, that it changes. And it changes based on the types of students in a building, it changes based on the types of curriculum and programming that a building, it changes based on student needs, it changes based on the principal leadership and how they want to utilize a building. So capacity isn't a fixed thing, but there are some things that we can agree on as a district and that's what we tried to nail down in that second year. So with enrollment, the board um, knows that we use a cohort survival methodology which is very common for school districts a cohort of students and how they survive to the next year. It sounds a little crass, but that's the idea. Some kids move, some kids open enroll somewhere else, go to private school, they come back from private school, they move into the district. Numbers churn over time and what we look for are patterns in the data over time. And then we started to talk about this idea of breaks and patterns and it was to get us to quit looking at enrollment as you are right or you are wrong. 
because what we do when we create enrollment projections is put our best effort into an estimate for enrollment based on patterns. And when the enrollment is higher or lower, it's because a pattern changed. And we had some breaks in pattern in that year. For instance, kindergarten had changed. Um, I, I'm, I'm not remembering the history exactly. Something had changed at, in a pattern at kindergarten. It could have been birth rates or something that had changed. We had a grade span change that year, and we didn't build in anything about how our enrollment at high school or middle school might change because of that new grade span. We knew something might change, but it was sort of a guess that we'll probably increase enrollment at the high school. I don't know, now that ninth grade is in there. So our decision was let's not do anything until we know a new pattern has changed. Well, as it turns out, we got a tremendous increase in high school enrollment um, when ninth grade was added at the high school. And we watched it over time, and now it's a, a pattern that's <coughs> built into our enrollment projections. Um, the number of students in a household will change over time as families age in place and elementary age kids age into secondary. And then we have this bit of undeveloped land up in, uh, particularly in northwest Maple Grove, there's um, undeveloped land, small amounts in other parts of the communities that are served by Osceola area schools, but we were really in particular looking at that area. So that's how we created enrollment. Um, then we started talking about capacity. And there's a couple of, wait, there's two things that are part of capacity. One is how many classrooms are in the building? And the second is how many kids do you put in the classroom? Well, it sounds easy. However, there's a lot of spaces that can look like classrooms, but depending on the students that need to be served, the program, the curriculum, not every classroom is available for 26 students. So we had to be really careful about thinking about what capacity would be, sorry. Um, so here's, here's how we looked at available classrooms. Wold architects and engineers spent um, a lot of time during that summer um, in between these two years helping us to really get a handle on the floor plans of every building and what we were calling an available classroom. So what we wanted to be sure is that every building had an appropriate number of grade level classrooms and that they had core support areas like cafeterias and gyms, and that there were sufficient academic support areas for things like special ed, English language, um, and whatever the, support, the supports that were needed for the students served in that building. And that's one place that will change. Could change throughout the year. It will change from year to year, and it will definitely be different from one building to the other, because the profile of students just isn't the same from one building to the other. And then we wanted each building to have two or three flexible spaces. So if fall comes and suddenly there's more kindergartners because there was a pattern change, we have a place to add a classroom. Or if something changed and we need another special ed classroom, that there was a place for flexibility for new things that are happening at the school that, that, weren't, um, that we hadn't anticipated. And then, um, so that was for elementary. And on secondary, we just had to make some assumptions and we're gonna be spending some time this summer getting a little more scientific along with the help of Wold. But for these last couple of years, we've been using a, an assumption in senior high that 80% of the classrooms that are available would be utilized and for middle school it's 75%. Those are the percents we have used. And the reason, um, there's lots of reasons and I'll just give you my high level understanding about that is that because of the way students take classes, we can't 100% of the time have every classroom filled. That there's always gonna be a classroom that for one period a day just isn't being utilized or for two periods a day just because of the way we have to um, um, put students in classrooms and the way that, cho that students choose. And that middle schools are even a little less efficient because of the teaming model. Um, so, so that's about an average for the industry and we landed there. And I think it's fairly close to accurate. We do, um, I think, have a little bit better utilization in, or higher utilization. I don't know if it's better. Higher utilization in some of our schools. So, um, so, th so we figured out then, here's how we're calculating enrollment. And with those elementary and secondary assumptions, here's how we're calculating capacity. Then how many of those enrolled students do we put in the rooms that are available for students? And I think we spent two, maybe three meetings on this very conversation. Because we started with, we know what our target class sizes are. As we're building budgets, we have targets. Let's apply the targets, and that will tell us 
what our available capacity is. So we applied the targets and looked at the data and went, well, this isn't what the principals are telling us. It appears that there's more room available here than what it's feeling like. What, what is the problem? So then we dug back in in conversations with the principals and started to, uh, to learn about, well, I have more EL classrooms than that. You can't just give me one. Or uh, we lower class size because we're a school that gets compensatory funding and our strategy with that is to lower class size. So we thought, how can we possibly address this? So we took a leap and changed from a target class size calculation to an average actual class size. So we went back through and made sure that every school had the, the um, classrooms that were necessary for the student population. And then we applied the average class size, the actual class size. So what that means is that capacity will definitely change every year because the average class sizes might change every year. So we applied at the elementary, at every grade level, the actual class size versus the target. And then at secondary, um, we applied a school-wide school -wide average class size. I wanna try to just say this in plain English. So what happened is that we have target class sizes, let's say it's 26 at an elementary school would be a target. We're gonna try to have that many students in each classroom. Uh, in reality, if a school gets um, compensatory funding, they might be only putting 23 students in a classroom. That might cause a need for an additional classroom. Well, there's two ways to look at that. One might be tough luck. We're gonna give you enough room for 26 per classroom. So that strategy now has been made unavailable to a principal. I cannot address my student needs by lowering class size. So we at, in ECMAC thought that is not our job. Our job is not to change the educational program. Our job is to meet the needs of the students in the way that they're currently being addressed. And so we landed on average actual class size. So then, I'll, then what we do, once we knew the number of available classrooms and then the number of students assigned to each classroom, we came up with student capacity. And as I said, that number is going to change from one year to the next. And this year was our second, this past year was our second year of calculating capacity. And some of our community members noticed that change. We can explain it, but it just makes it harder. And so, you know, that's something that the board needs to um, be really clear about. And it's one of the reasons to not get past that stop sign until, and start creating options until you're really clear about every assumption that was built um, into that. These are actually slides that were presented in that spring. So we've been very transparent about this, but I think folks understand it when they need to understand it. Is that old thing when the, the student is ready, the teacher arrives or something? I think when it's, when it's at your doorstep, that's when you begin to take it in. But we have to get it at our doorstep today and really understand it because we know when change comes, families are gonna want to understand it when they're ready. So then we looked at some other areas. So perhaps a building has plenty of classrooms, but the building was not built to serve as many students as it's serving. And that's the case of some of our schools um, that even if we wanted to make additional classrooms out of places that should have been a computer lab, let's just say that school doesn't have a computer lab. They can't have preschool. So we take away all these extra areas but their cafeteria still isn't going to be big enough. Their media center still isn't going to be big enough. Parking lots still aren't going to be big enough. So what we did was took some um, Minnesota Department of Education guidelines, just some really high level square footage guidelines, and also applied that analysis that year. And that was a request that came through ECMAC. How else should we look at these buildings? And that was very helpful. So then um, we thought that we had come to a place, I, I'm trying to remember if we got past the stop sign that year, but we wanted to be sure that we had come to a shared understanding of need, and we did. And we got to the end and we said, okay, now, we think as an ECMAC group, we're gonna deliver this set of needs to the school board, this was a year ago, so that we can have staff begin to develop options um, over that summer. And so these are the recommendations that um, the superintendent ultimately made to the school board, and these were, these were the things that staff got to work on to begin to develop options um, last summer. We had some overcapacity conditions <coughs> at some elementary schools and at some, at some secondary schools. 
and then we wanted to begin to prepare for enrollment <coughs> growth. It's in the area served by Fernbrook. Fernbrook is not over capacity, and it has um, um, some capacity available, but we knew that that's where the growth area was coming, and so we wanted staff to begin to look at that. So that was the recommendations that were made at the end of the summer, and Ron's gonna take you through what happened last year. And that brings us up to our current year. Um, so first, I just wanna highlight again that, um, that ECMAC, ECMAC's work continues to be a strategic priority for the district. And again, that's to continue to grow and develop that trust within our community as it relates to enrollment and capacity. So as we continue to look at that model that we received from Wold, um, this year really kind of highlighted bringing us to that developing options standpoint. So you don't see the stop sign on, on this particular um, slide. It's because we were gonna be actively engaged starting with our staff developing those options last summer and then bringing that to ECMAC for further review and observation and recommendation. So if we look at uh, last year's summary of progress that was um, presented to the superintendent and brought to the board, there were a few different available options that were identified on things that staff could take a look at to develop options for, um, for addressing overcapacity concerns at the, um, at the buildings that were identified. The first is an attendance area adjustment. Uh, potentially we could build a new school. We do have some property in the, that Northwest Maple Grove area that has been identified potentially for a future elementary school. Um, we could construct an addition or expansion of existing schools. Um, potentially, if we had uh, undercapacity schools, we could consider uh, closing or repurposing a school. And then the last option would be to do nothing, to continue on as is. And so staff um, went through the summer and really dug into what are some options to bring forth to um, ECMAC. And so uh, staff spent a lot of time out in buildings with site leaders to gain further insight into how available options might address the capacity concerns at their particular sites. They also spent a lot of time looking at that data, again, that had been presented, trying to use the most up-to-date um, data, um, whether it be site plans, enrollment data, um, things like that, to make sure that as they developed options, it was with the best and most up-to-date data available. Um, and then studied available resources to support in the development of options. Patricia talked a little bit about um, the year before bringing in Wold Architect and leveraging that resource in developing options. Understanding um, instructional practices and, and student impact and how they're um, impacted in available options. So working with our um, DLTL team. And then also um, exploring finance options. Um, what, what are the different levers that we could utilize to fund potential options? Um, for addressing those concerns. <clears throat> and staff, through their work throughout the summer, um, identified a short-term and a long-term approach to addressing the capacity concerns. Um, the short-term solution focused specifically on the capacity concerns of the elementary schools. So um, at Garden City, Basswood, and Rice Lake. Um, that was a short-term solution that um, the goal would be to get something online to address that by the fall of 2020. And then the long-term option um, would look more at those secondary schools and finding an option that could be in place by the fall of uh, 2022. And so the, after all of the work uh, that staff did throughout last summer and looking at our available funding mechanisms, um, they brought forth the short-term option to address overcapacity concerns at the three elementary schools um, by constructing an addition at both Garden City Elementary and at Oakview Elementary School and then doing boundary adjustments to relieve some of the capacity pressure at Rice Lake and at Basswood. That all could fit within a um, roughly $15 million price tag that we had some capacity under our lease levy authority that gave us the ability to add on classroom space um, for some capacity needs. And so um, staff worked with the board 
all through the fall looking at our levy process and really asking the board to keep lease levy in the levy process um, as an option to keep it on the table so that ECMAC could do their work and could really take a look at if this option of adding additions to these uh, two buildings and doing boundary adjustments was the right option to move forward. And so in December, the board approved uh, our levy process, including the funding for uh, lease levy for these additional additions. And so uh, just showing this model again, for the first time in ECMAC's history, as we entered into the fall looking at this option, and uh, again, going through the process of making observations and ultimately a recommendation, the whole framework was really at play. So the work continued um, from a staff perspective as it relates to enrollment and the data, going through to ECMAC, making those observations and recommendations. But now we are uh, bringing in that light blue uh, process as well, which is really once a recommendation was made from uh, ECMAC, really engaging the community to get that feedback. And so the whole cycle um, was really at play. In the midst of ECMAC's work um, to analyze the new enrollment data that came out in the fall um, and begin looking at the staff recommendation, that recommendation to do the additions at the two schools and do boundary adjustments, a question surfaced from a few ECMAC members as well as at a board work session uh, in December about an idea of another option and uh, to move the STEM program from Weaver Lake Elementary and moving it to Oakview and then adding an addition at Weaver Lake and doing boundary adjustments and creating a boundary there at Weaver Lake and boundary adjustments to relieve pressure at, um, at Basswood and at Rice Lake. Because of this request, um, ECMAC went back to the table and they kind of brought forth some of the work and the thinking that they had done throughout the summer and really the four options that they had considered and ultimately led to the one option that was brought forth to, to ECMAC just to make sure that ECMAC had all of the information and then we could walk through it together as a group. Um, and through that process, option B and option D um, were discarded because they weren't deemed viable by ECMAC just as staff had, um, had come to that same conclusion throughout the summer. However, uh, ECMAC believed uh, as a group that option C, which is that option of moving the STEM program from Weaver to Oakview, um, needed additional consideration. And so that option um, was one in addition to the one option that staff had brought forth um, ECMAC wanted to continue to explore uh, both of those options. So after uh, that decision by ECMAC, which happened in early January, um, staff came together to analyze the implications of what that meant for the future work. Uh, the, we believe that to be able to properly consider each of those two options and the impact that it would have, additional time was needed. We needed to understand, in particular for that option C for that Weaver Lake, what was the programmatic implications of moving a program that's very successful, that's at Weaver Lake, to another building? What, what is the impact on, on students and families and staff? Um, we were also um, under some time constraints in, in terms of the construction timeline. We knew that we are already pretty tight in order to be able to thoroughly um, vet and evaluate through ECMAC that option A that staff had recommended, as well as to go out to the community and get community engagement. And now with this other option that we had in play, we knew that was gonna create additional time needs. And so um, the ability from a timeline, from a construction timeline perspective was called into question. And we had a lot of concerns about being able to meet those construction timelines to be able to open those um, buildings in 2020 and take advantage of that lease levy authority that had been granted through the levy process. So ultimately, um, staff made the decision to pause the short-term option um, that ECMAC had been working on. And so we really uh, put up a stop sign before that recommendation came forth to really keep our work at the developing option stage. Um, we knew that we still needed to work through, we still needed to vet those, but instead of doing the short-term and the long-term approach, 
Instead, staff made the determination to really come together and put together a, a comprehensive solution that looked at all of our elementary and our secondary buildings and come together with a comprehensive solution. So there were several technical, other technical kind of side benefits that staff um, realized that a pause would, um, the district would benefit from the pause. Uh, first of all, uh, Patricia talked a little bit about some of the elementary assumptions that had been established and the board um, affirmed those assumptions back in 2017 as it relates to what do we expect from each elementary school as part of those core assumptions. Um, we believe that the, we needed some time to put together our secondary assumptions. And so instead of just using kind of the industry trend of 80% um, utilization or 75% utilization, that we would bring in the experts around our district to really determine what should be, how should we um, look at capacity and what should those base assumptions be for our secondary buildings across the district. And also looking at what are best practices for our instructional design space, for our next generation instructional um, space design. If we're going to spend uh, resources either on additions or even looking at our LTFM work and some of the space um, design and things that we're doing from LTFM, making sure that we um, understand and realize what are those next generation instructional spaces, what should they look like so we have some standards to go by. So we needed some time to be able to do that and the pause gave us that time. Also looking at our, our extracurricular needs. Are there needs across the, the district, in particular at our secondary uh, level, in terms of extracurricular activities um, and needs that we might have, either between our different buildings or compared to uh, some of our, our districts, our neighboring districts? So uh, taking some time to really analyze and look at that. And then uh, the last piece is to uh, gather community feedback. Really understand what what is the district or the, the community members interested in? So uh, a pause would give us some time to gather that community feedback through a scientific survey. Again, the role of ECMAC is to look at data. Um, and so a community survey would allow us more data to be able to evaluate and to look at as we're making recommendations. So if the district's um, staff's perspective was in that technical analysis and looking at some of the, the positive reasons for the change and what really drove the decision to make a pause in our short-term um, uh, process that we are going through, the adaptive reflection is really what we heard from some of our ECMAC members. We came to them uh, at the end of January to communicate our decision as a staff to pause the work of the short-term solution and wrap it into a long-term um, comprehensive solution across um, all of our uh, buildings. And, um, and we got some, some feedback um, that was a little bit different than um, kind of our intent in terms of the pause. And so anytime that uh, school districts contemplate enrollment and capacity solutions, which sometimes can include boundary changes, there are often responses from community members, and sometimes it's just a few community members, sometimes it's a lot of community members, and sometimes it can come in the forms of legal threats, sometimes it can come in the forms of wanting to challenge the data. And um, there, some of the feedback that we got when we communicated the pause from our ECMAC members was their concern that the decision to pause was based on that, was based on some of the what they perceived was feedback that we were receiving from the community. Um, and so this caused them to uh, raise questions like whose voice really matters and making statements like privilege wins or pr privilege won again. Um, those are things that we, um, that we heard from the, the ECMAC committee. It wasn't all of the members of ECMAC that were saying that, but it certainly was um, a large number of ECMAC members that gave us that feedback. And so we spent uh, several meetings as we went forth from there, really digging into um, where that perspective was coming from and to really understand the why so that we could make sure that we are um, creating a path forward because we still have a lot of really important work to do through ECMAC.
So with that, and on, um, on, with that, you're going to hear a little bit more when we get into our strategic priority results, um, a little bit of how some of that uh, feedback that we received and some of the work that we do in those subsequent meetings, how it informs some of our next steps in terms of some of the things that we're going to do from a community engagement standpoint. So then as we look at the next steps, where do we go from here? We know that um, we still have some, some challenges as it relates to capacity across our district that we, that ECMEC has some important work to do. The first step that we have to do, which we do every year, is to recruit new members. Um, the great thing, and I think it's a testament to um, certainly the group members that we have, our community members that we have, it also I think is a testament to the leadership of Patricia in leading our group. Um, we don't have any more turnover in ECMAC uh, members than we have in previous years. And in fact, most of the people that, um, that have decided not to continue on is because they're involved in other items or one of them was, has been here since the beginning and just got busy and other stuff. So there's a general sense that people um, are still really engaged and they still really want to be a part of the process, which is great. But we're going to go through a process um, over the next month or so of recruiting new members and going through that process of selecting uh, members to get started. And then we'll go through a, um, a training uh, period with them to make sure that they get up to speed to really impress upon them that this is not a decision making group. It's an advisory group. And so they're making observations and recommendations back to our administration um, that ultimately then administration will take and potentially bring to the board if, um, if appropriate. The, the second step is to, again, take a look at what are those instructional space design and how um, potentially might they affect our capacity. So if they come up with a set of base assumptions that's different than what we have assumed at this point in our uh, last couple of summary of progress reports, it potentially could affect our capacity. And so we need to make sure that we have a real clear idea of what those uh, best practices are, how are they going to affect capacity, and then ultimately how might that inform future recommendations. Um, also our activity space, we talked a little bit about that in terms of our extracurricular activities. So um, we have uh, groups that are working on both of these, instructional design as well as our activities, to really take a look at what is best practice and what are the needs of the district. Um, the next one is to get school board direction on capacity calculations. We talked about that back in um, October of 2017, we brought the base elementary assumptions to the board and the board affirmed those as kind of a base elementary school. And that's what we've used to calculate um, capacity at the elementary schools. We still have work to do on those secondary capacity. But the other piece that we haven't um, had a conversation with the board yet is what uh, Patricia talked about, the difference between our targeted class size uh, capacity calculation and our actual class size capacity calculation. Um, I think it's important that we have that conversation with the board and that we get direction from the board in terms of what is the best way to calculate capacity as we enter into this season in the fall of using those capacity numbers to drive our recommendations. And then um, as that last point is, is that um, our hope is for ECMAC to make recommendations back to uh, administration in December or January of 2019, 2020, um, and then continue on that cycle, that pattern of uh, going to community engagement at that point. So with that, that's a very brief overview <laughs> of the history of ECMAC, and we can certainly take any questions that you might have. Questions, board members? Comments? You'll get a summary of progress. We're up right away again, but. I mean, I just have some concern around our communities, specifically families that are impacted by the recommendations. Um, and you know, I have, I have a lot of questions around what's the recruitment look like, who, wh where, wh what's the representation of the schools. Um, I appreciate everybody that's been part of this. I think it's been a really long process, but I also think there's been a lot of frustration from people sitting on ECMAC, but then also outside of ECMAC and viewing. Um, I think that I was just last week somewhere and somebody said to me, you know, asked like, whatever happened with, like there was a pause and then we haven't heard anything. 
And I think that the missed opportunity is that it's not a communication issue, it's an engagement issue. I think we um, can improve how we, I think it's one thing you can slap it on a website and expect people to go in their busy lives and read it, but I think that's why when it's in front of somebody they get, um, they become more invested in it and it becomes more of an emotional situation and it's not just one school, it's every school, I've heard from people in every single school from Garden City to Basswood to Rice Lake to Weaver with the exact same concerns and so um, I just think it's a delicate topic as we all know, <laughs> of course. Um, but I just, I, I just have a lot of questions around, you know, I know we'll get into it during the priority, but you know, the next steps, I think that um, we can't discredit people's, um, you know, even the adaptive reflection here, what people are saying, and I, um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. I, I think to respond to that briefly, we had a lot of conversation about this idea of communication um, or engagement, and, and we, and Barb did a, a nice job at taking us through some consensus workshop um, and really looking at what do they mean by that? What are they looking for? And so you're gonna hear a little bit about that in the <coughs> priority results section, but we spent a lot of time really trying to um, get to what what is that, what does that look like? What are some specific strategies that we can employ to better engage the community? and and what are we engaging them with? Because right now we don't have any specific recommendations to take to the community to get engagement for. And so that's, I think, what has been the challenge. I don't know. I guess I would just say though, it's not about that all the time, it's about building trust and how you build trust is through relationship. <coughs> and so when there's huge pauses between something and we're, you're working on it all the time, but not everybody is. And so um, it's, about, it's about the relationships and rebuilding that trust because from my perspective, there's a lot of trust that's been broken for a variety of reasons through this process. Um, and I think that this is, if we're gonna pause and there's an opportunity to do some things that are maybe different, you know, I think the foundation has been laid and now what does the future look like with it? I think it's gonna be really critical to engage and I mean, I would even go as far, I mean, getting our board members more involved because the other thing I, I think when you have just an, in, not just, I shouldn't say, but have an advisory committee with no real um, power to make a decision um, absent of decision makers. I, I, I feel uncomfortable as a board member when like a group is meeting and then the only time we really get updates is in a situation like this or when a recommendation is moved forward. So, um, and I know we have members sitting on it, but it's still not a, they're not really a voice at the table. Um, so, so, I, I, um, so Ron, you mentioned clarifying roles within mm -hmm. ECMAC and amongst um, potentially the board and others and staff. I think that's gonna be really important work. Yep. Um, so we have the right role clarity and the right communication to the board and to the community in terms of engagement as well. And, and I know that there's uh, information that comes out in the email about what ECMAC discussed and there's a lot of forums that's kind of a push of communication, but like at the last ECMAC committee that we talked about, communication is different than engagement. So I, I know that the team has spent a lot of time in the last sessions talking about that. So they're definitely on it and I look forward to hearing more about that. One additional question, terms for the um, ECMAC committee. Um, is, are there terms, are you thinking about staggering that so that we've got um, fresh voices coming in on a regular cycle, maybe like a third, a third, third? Um, because I'm a little concerned if, I didn't quite hear that there, I heard a little bit about um, low turnover. I'm a little concerned if we've got the same voices for extended periods of time. Yeah, I'll clarify, because if I said low turnover, that's not necessarily the case. I, um, this year's turnover has is representative of past years, so it's virtually the same that we've had in the past. Um, we have said we published two to three years. Um, I will say, though, that there is some challenges with um, getting too many new members on, and that's what we experienced this year a little bit, just to have that knowledge and that history, even um, that sense of understanding. And, and we had some um, veteran group members this year that when there were questions about what is the role of ECMAC, they're the ones that actually spoke up and were able to say, well, we're an advisory team, we're not a decision-making team. And so some of that came through, um, that if we have too much turnover, we won't have that. So we've said, we've stated two to three years. We haven't necessarily told people after three years, because we're just getting to that place now, that you have to get off. And I think we only have one 
remaining member and I don't know their status for next year anyway so it hasn't gotten to the place where they're um, kind of long in the tooth they they um, that that turnover has kind of naturally happened anyways okay. can I jump in and just I want to um, share it might be helpful to know that about seven I think members volunteered to be on a subcommittee mm -hmm. about for ECMAC about communication and community engagement because it was very clear that information is one thing but like you said we are missing a FaceTime component that I think they think is strongly needed, and they'll help design it. What does that look like? Who, who should be involved? What should um, be communicated? How should that engagement look? And they'll help form, inform a plan that we'll bring back to ECMAC then in the fall for the group as a whole to review and consider. Is that what they want for community engagement? We have had a couple of, it, it kind of happened organically. It wasn't necessarily part of a community engagement plan, but a couple of opportunities to go out to some buildings that have, that are specifically affected by some of the capacity concerns and do some, some open forums, some PTA meetings. It's been really helpful. I think um, we've gotten uh, um, really honest feedback, I think, which is good. And so even doing some of those things, I think, help with some of that community engagement. So again, it's not, hasn't been necessarily intentional as part of a community engagement um, program, but still, I think, helps to build some of that trust, so. Um, one quick follow-up. So um, I agree with the uh, assessment that we do need to look at the capacity calculations and target versus actual, because when we look at the data, there's some pretty significant differences between the two, and I think that those are things that as we consider the future needs, we have to have both the objective standard as well as a knowledge of what choices have been made and why we have that difference. And if we assume the choices at the building level are fixed, um, we might not have the transparency that we desire when we begin to talk about the future needs states. So I think both are gonna be important, so I look forward to more work um, coming up on that. I just have one question. Um, you are asking for a school board direction on capacity calculations for secondary schools in, in your next steps? Uh, we'll be, at some point, we'll be bringing that, yes. Once our, okay. we have a group that's working on a staff group right now that's working through that. Okay. And then my hope would be is that when we come to talk about the, um, the target versus actual class size, that we can also get some guidance from the board on, on those calculations too. That's what I was just wondering, when, when we would be giving that feedback. Yeah, this, this spring we had the assistant soups and the secondary principals went out and visited buildings and they will now have discussions led by um, Kim and um, Kelly and Steve to determine what those basic uh, facilities are, are to have in, as far as our rooms available and et cetera. And then the other piece, as Ron said and you said, Heather, then we gotta look at the class size and what we're gonna do with that. And for them, it's also a matter of that 75, 80% uh, room utilization on a class by class or hour by hour basis too. So we'll have all that supposedly done. They're smiling at me because the middle school principals walked in and Kelly and Steve are supposedly by <laughs> August for you to take a look at. Okay. Sorry, one more question <laughs> that sparked. Um, so as we do that work at the middle school and high school level, I'd be curious to know if there's um, emerging trends in increasing utilization um, and kind of what, um, what we might be seeing with that. So what are the trade-offs to increasing utilization? Are there new innovations in how we use space so that we can increase that utilization? They saw so, go ahead. Well, no, I was gonna say that's definitely part of what we've been, uh, we've been doing, the visits with the uh, principals to look at what some of the other districts have done is informing us. So a lot of the uh, sort of uh, adapted type of furniture or the layouts of the rooms are some of the things we're seeing along with learning on display. So we've seen quite a number of different districts and different ways that it's been approached. I keep forgetting I'm supposed to facilitate. Uh, do we have any other questions? I feel like I'm stealing the mic from uh, Ron all the time. Do, do we have any other questions or comments on the ECMAC report? Anything else from the committee members right now that are here? We're good? Okay. All right. Are we videoing the uh, summary of progress on? No, we're not. So we'll, we're going to take about a 
two minute recess uh, to give Randy a chance to uh, end the video and then we'll start up with a summary of progress and we'll start with uh, the ECMAT one.